Thanks for staying with us. It's time to go to the press to see what the headlines are. What are these headlines that made it to the front pages of some of our national dailies? Our guest this morning is Mr. Stephen Agiode, a solicitor. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Okay, sir. Good morning. Okay, let's begin with the Punch newspaper. A leading headline here, almost the only headline, is uh, government plans evacuation comes as flood hits 28 states. Flood. Uh, the rider here is flooding affects 133 local government areas, 526,703 persons, and Tinubu promises aid. So uh, let's get your take. Well, um, the flooding problem in Nigeria is perennial. I know that sometimes it's the result of um, other countries releasing their dams and all that. We don't know what this one is now. Um, I think we have a national uh, emergency relief agency and all that. that uh, you would think that this is what they should swing into action or to resettle these people and all that. One can understand there may be some difficulty because uh, already we have other security problems and all that in which people are being resettled and all that. But when the president has given his order, we hope that uh, it will be carried out as quickly as possible to bring relief to people on earth. I would hope the governors too will swing in to uh, uh, offer what kind of uh, whatever help they can help in their own states to relieve this uh, emergency. Yeah, I, but I always wonder, this agency, NEMA, for instance, and uh, Meteorological Agency, Meteorological Agency actually warns uh, before time that floods will come in X, Y, Z areas and all that. But they seem always not to be prepared or they, some kind of preparation for an outbreak like this or something like this. And it has to take the president to make a pronouncement. But even at that Sometimes we find these natural, uh, natural uh, disasters occurring and then there's, there's hope that there's going to be some kind of relief from the government. Sometimes it takes up to years before this relief comes. And when it comes, it makes no sense at all. I, I, case in point, uh, at some point, was when my village was ravaged by, by storm and houses were blown away and all that. And the government came and said that they were going to bring aid. It took like three or five years for them to come. Some houses that were blown off, uh, they were given uh, three sheets of uh, um, aluminum uh, roofing sheets, three of them. And then some houses, some farms that were lost and people were, uh, were promised aid, they came and gave them like uh, five tubers of yam uh to to plant <laughs> and so it was just funny it came after three or five years after the e event and it made no sense at all so what is it that that keeps these um agencies from doing their work as that when do is it a matter of policy is it a matter of law is it a matter of bureaucratic bottlenecks or what because when people need this aid it doesn't come yeah, well <laughs> We would first of all point out that we, we operate a democracy. Um, those areas where, like in your area, where all these things happen, there's a representative, there's a House of Rep member, mm -hmm. there's a Senate member, and all that. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to make sure that these issues are brought to the Senate and the appropriate committee reduce the actions of the uh, relief agency mm -hmm. to ensure that they improve. So, you ask the question, what was your House of Rest member doing? What, of your, what was your senator doing? Mm. What was your governor doing? How did they operate in unison to bring this, these uh, malfunctions to national focus so that uh, this matters after the fact can be refused so they don't keep happening again? That's the beauty of a democracy. Our democratic structure is not working as it should. This is why you are seeing the problem. So instead of them, seeing themselves as an investigatory body, look at what has happened and say, okay, why did it happen? And, and hold people to account so that it doesn't happen to be, again. Our democratic system is not really working as it should. If, if the uh, uh, structure meant for investigating uh, executive action or working as it should, even the president right now will not be where he is. He will be 
on this spot, trying to see whether these things are working as they should, mm. because he knows he will be under fire from the Senate, the House of Reps, and all that, if it is not working. That, that's the principal problem we have in our system. Our democracy is not really working as it should. Yeah, I, I think you just nailed it. It's not working because even the representative from those places, not. I just use my place because that's uh, the closest to me, but I've seen so many other places that this happens. And it happens that even if this thing is, uh, is, is open to everybody, everybody knows that this, is, this has happened, the representative from that place still needs to lobby before he can be given an ear, and then they will decide. Uh, why do you need to lobby in something that we know that people are suffering and it is in public glare and everybody is seeing it? You said it all. Democracy is not really working in Nigeria. Everybody's thinking about their personal gains and not thinking about what the people will gain. Now, NLC plans mass procession as Ajayro honors police invitation today. Remember the story about Ajayro, the NLC president, financing, allegedly financing terrorism and all, so many other things that were leveled against him right after NLC cried out that the police or the DSS had raided their office. And the DSS came out to say that they, it was not them. And the police came out to also uh, acknowledge that they were the ones responsible, but they were looking for a terrorist from another country who may have gone to hide in NLC headquarters and all that. So with that poor timing, let me say so, uh, Ajero was invited and supposedly he is financing terrorism. Now NLC in solidarity is having a walk and a prayer uh, procession uh, because of this invitation that Ajaro is going to honor today. He couldn't honor it the first time that they, were, they invited him. So what do you have to say about the police invitation in the first time, the allegations against Ajaro, and the timing of uh, uh, this whole thing? Well, first of all, one has to commend Comrade Ajaro for answering the call of the police. This is the duty of the police to investigate crime. And it's the duty of all citizens, whenever called upon to assist in such investigations, to, to go to the police and uh, give whatever information they have on, on such matters. But one, the, the problem is this, that one finds in these kinds of matters that the police is entering into uh, uh, unnecessary political matters. Because essentially, uh, a protest by the people is uh, what it is. It's an exercise of fundamental human rights and all that. I, I, I struggle to see how the police wants to find evidence for all these what kind of allegations they are making about one man sponsoring uh, a, a whole protest. And then they are labeling the, such a protest as terrorism. I mean, it's, it's, it seems as you know, but uh, let's see how it plays out. The NLC must be commended for the current action they are taking. They are Head has gone to meet the police, yes, to answer the allegations. They are peacefully doing a prayer march and all that. They are not going violent. Well, that's, these things are commendable. So let's see how the investigation pans out. But I struggle to see where the police is going with all this and all that. But uh, as law-abiding as law citizens and all that, let us watch what is going on. Let the, the NRC chairman is doing the right thing. And as a prayer meeting, yes, that's okay. And all that, there's no uh, call to protest or anything over that. They are not saying that the man is above the law. He's not. He's not above the law. He will go and face whatever allegations the police have in the system and all that. But I struggle to see where the police is going with this. I mean, you know, well, well let's see. Uh, maybe they cannot do what they are, they are, they are trying to do because uh, Ajayro is high up there. And I just my heart just goes to people who may not be as high up as Ajayro, uh, who may be labeled uh, one thing or the other. I saw a story yesterday in one of the tabloids uh, talking about a, a boy or a man who resigned his, uh, his, uh, from his job uh, through text message to his boss. And the language he used in the text message uh, did not really go down well with the boss. So he got him arrested. And having arrested him, uh, after a while, he changed his mind and said he was withdrawing the case. But this boy found himself in police custody. Uh, after that, he was thrown in jail. 
pending when he could afford 100,000 Naira uh, bail. And he didn't have that, and he stayed there for years until an, a non-governmental organization had to go and facilitate his release. Just because he couldn't get 100,000 Naira, and even when the case was withdrawn by the person who brought it, he was still thrown into jail. And there are lots and lots of, of cases like that. People are waiting trial, people who have never been taken to court but was, were just thrown there because the police said so, that he was a criminal and all that. I hope that there will be reforms in the police and then people will start to get confidence in the police. Now, uh, this uh, headline, before we move to another newspaper, Atiku Bode judge disagree over 2027 presidential uh, um, ambition. Bode just is saying that the, the presidency has to remain in the South because a, a northerner has uh, stayed there for eight years. Uh, we also, and he was also saying that Atiku, if he has to contest, will have to wait till 2031 because that is when it should return to the North. Now, we know that some political parties, like the PDP, for instance, has a zoning formula which is in their constitution, but we don't seem to have that in the, the the general constitution for our country. Don't you think it's high time we put this zoning thing uh, to the constitution and make sure that nobody ever has to contest from any zone if it is not their turn? Because whether we like it or not, we've been talking about the fact that any good person can come from anywhere to contest, but it always brings problems. So shouldn't we make it formal? Well, in one of, in one of the uh, non justiciable uh, provisions of the Constitution, you will find that uh, there's a, a provision for federal character principle, yeah. which means essentially appointments and all that should take the color of federal character in, the, in terms that uh, 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 every group, ethnic group, geopolitical group should, uh, should uh, find itself well represented in appointments and all that. So I think it is from there that you derive what you now call zoning policy. That is, oh, that uh, one section of the nation also should not monopolize political power and all that. Uh, you see, uh, where you have a federation like uh, ours and the circumstances in which it was brought together by the British and uh, all that you you will need to make this kind of arrangements in order to keep unity. Mm -hmm. I remember discussing once with uh, Professor Dacon, and he telling me about the situation uh, in uh, Belgium and all that that they have to make so so much absorb. You know, you, they have the Flemish, the this, the that, the French, and all that. So they have to make all these kind of funny arrangements in order to keep the nation as one. Well. That's what we are seeing here. So, where well, that's where the zoning po policy is coming from. This is the derivative from the federal character principle, which is all in the constitution. But then, you, you see, I would then focus on PDP and what has happened to it. You see, the, one of the major tragedies of our political, our current political experiment is that we have no opposition parties, properly so called. PDP, since over eight years now, I, I found itself embroiled in one crisis or the other. So they don't know where they are going and all that. So effectively, we have one, almost a one-party system now in place. That's why you see, because opposition parties are not well organized, that's why you see, you, are seeing, you see a lot of defections from PDP because it's so disorganized. They are all moving to APC, which was what was happening when PDP was also in power. We don't know how to do organize our parties when they are in opposition. It, one of the main tragedies of this democratic experiment is that PDP and to some extent the Labour Party are not functioning as well as they are. All we hope that uh, my greatest hope really is that uh, PDP, Labour Party, and all that will uh, take as important the duty of organizing their parties after losing election to become strong opposition. It will benefit all of us. I am not 
I'm very unhappy about the bickerings in PDP, rivers, but they, but they just to the article today, they are infighting and all that and all that. One understands uh, the problem that happened that uh, made the article in, in, the, uh, in the last elections as they are political candidates. One would have thought they have, been, they have had enough time to sit back and reflect on that and decide what to do in future as a unified party and all that. If you don't want Article to conduct, there are ways in which you manage that process with the party immediately after the election and deal with all that so that you can face the job of being but, but on, that's on my That is my concern. My concern, uh, really, uh, because the argument why Article in the first place came to contest was that their constitution talks about zoning. It is not the national constitution that talks about zoning. So in their constitution, the last person who was PDP president was from the south. And so it's, the next person should be from the north. That was, for me, is a valid argument. Until that zoning thing is made national, is put in our own constitution as a nation, then that argument will always be coming up. If we, we had put it in our constitution, nobody from the north would have, would have read his head to say that it is, I can contest as well, because the constitution will spell it out. So that's why I'm thinking, just like the office of the first lady, for instance, it's not in the constitution, but we spend a humongous amount on that office that is not constitutional. So if we think it is important, why not just make it constitutional for everybody to just know and align with it, just like we have the federal character? Well, that's it. The federal character principle. The zoning principle is a derivative from the federal character principle. So, because the idea of federal character principle is that let's share with, let everybody be I'll brought share, in and yes. need to. So, the zoning principle is also, oh, let nobody monopolize. So, that it's, it's, it's a derivative. Um, you and I are not members of the PDP. We are just talking as members of the public. Yes. But we will hope. Uh, PDP gets his house in order. We, we can stand aside and look, but they should get their house in order internally. There's nothing you and I can do about what is going on in PDP. They have a constitution. A constitution is something members have agreed to abide by. Mm -hmm. They should sit down and uh, work properly as a party. And if they are not doing so, we hope that other parties will come up and organize themselves better and become opposition and take over power at some point. That's how democracy works. We are not members of their party. We can only observe. Uh, they should get their own act in order. Just to break That's away from, from what we are saying now, but related to it anyway, but, uh, do you think this multi-party system is paying uh, at all? Uh, because we have so many parties that sometimes we even forget the number of parties that we have. Do you think uh, the two-party, three-party system would have been better for us? Because even APC is an amalgamation of so many parties that came together and say, okay, let us be one. Do you think that uh, so many parties is doing us uh, uh, more good than harm or more harm than good? Well, there's nothing wrong with us having so many parties. It's the trend in most democracies. If you, look, if you go to India, they have many parties and other, but they know the major ones. In Britain, for instance, you still have the Raven Looney Party and many other parties there. Uh, but you know the major ones, Labour and the uh, Tory party. In in the US too, you have several parties, but we know the major ones. I mean, you see the other day, Kennedy just withdrew. He was of the Libertarian Party or something like that, and all that. You have many parties there too. They know the major ones. Here too, we have many parties. We know the major That's how democracy is. So there's nothing actually wrong with that. It's only in our case that the uh, parties are not really parties. They are not uh, serious uh, 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 and arrangements that are working, functioning optimally. Everything here is about money, position, and advantage, and all that. It's not about some kind of ideology, some kind of common uh, beliefs in, 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 some, or in some way of organizing society that is different from one another, that is propelling you. But even in America, you can see the problem now. The Republican Party is having its own problems. Then it, it used to be known for some things that uh, and all that, and it, it had a set of principles um, basically warned around the, uh, the ideas of uh, Bonayak and uh, Milton Friedman, but they are moving away from that. Uh, you have now have a Trump that is just about himself, and so the party is losing form and ideology. It happens in democracies, but you need to just get it right. There's nothing wrong with multi party system at all.
it's okay. It's yeah, okay. I'm just I'm just wondering the kind of the kind of intensity our politics uh, was in the time that we had just two parties, for instance, the uh, National Republican Convention and the uh, SDP, NRC and SDP. Uh, how fierce the the contest was, and how uh, I, I don't know. So that's why that's why I'm thinking aloud. That uh, aggregation was. Uh, I did this way of trying to come to power. You, you didn't realize what was happening. He uh, just artificially formed two parties. What the, all he really intended was to be, was to be like president. No, no, let's move away from that. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can move from that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, let's go to Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, there's a headline. Most of these ones have we've dealt with in the Punch newspaper, but this headline is saying Nakon needs systemic reforms. That's according to the presidency. Uh, that is the Na National Hajj Commission of Nigeria needs uh, systemic reforms. Uh, that's according to presidency. Um, so many people have said in the first place there shouldn't be a nakon. Uh, there shouldn't be. There shouldn't be the kind of role that the presidency or the the government is playing in uh, these commissions, whether it is for Hajj or for. Christian pilgrimages. They should do this as personal uh, things, and whatever support the government is going to give should be uh, very minimal. Uh, just making sure they protect their people that go out to another country for for pilgrimage of any sort. But the presidency is talking of reforms, which means they're still thinking about spending things like uh, money as much as ninety billion naira for for pilgrimages that should not be. Uh, so, but I don't know what you think about this. Is it a reform that we're looking for in NACON and any other agency in charge of pilgrimage or a scrapping of it? The existence of bodies like this are a direct attack on our constitution. Our constitution says the state should not sponsor any religion. It's very clear. It's one of the clearest provisions of our constitution. Everybody knows it. Every lawyer knows it. Every Nigerian that has ever bothered to read the constitution knows it. So why are we still doing this? This is a complete illegality. Uh, that is why I say sometimes you see, these are some of the reasons why our democracy doesn't work. For expediency, we abandon the clear words of the constitution and start doing what we like. There's no basis in law or in the constitution for having all these uh, bodies. And in any case, it's also an abuse of some of these religions. We do not say that uh, you should, governments should sponsor people. It says if you can on your own, if you look at many of these religions and look at into their uh, books, you will find that it is there. In, uh, that if you can afford to do this, you should do it. Mm. So, it, it then amounts even, I guess, it, to a form of abuse of, the, of, of their own beliefs for them to be uh, wanting government to do this. But the most important thing in the public uh, in, 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 is that it is totally wrong, totally illegal. You have government operating in total illegality when it has all these bodies and all that that appears to fund uh, some religions or state religions. They are, they, well, how do they, for instance, the uh, 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 tra traditional religions uh, are also Nigerians. Mm. You spend that 90 billion. How much are you spending on traditional religions? How much are you spending on the other ceremony? Supposing I'm a Buddhist, will you spend on my own religion? Uh, or supposing I'm a, an agnostic, will you spend on my non religion? I mean, this is absurd. Uh, and we all know it. It's government operating in illegality. And uh, one looks forward to the day when we will bring ourselves back to the realm of rural, rule of law in this matter. Hmm. Well, I don't know. So, so many things, like you said, uh, the constitution is abandoned by the same people that are supposed to uphold this constitution. And I don't know how we can move forward as a, a, a nation. Um, we'll go to the Guardian newspaper right now. On the Guardian newspaper, uh, Criminal Justice Act ineffective seven years after NBA laments. So I'd like your comment on that. You're a solicitor yourself, and let's know uh, how it's supposed to work and how it is working right now, criminal justice system. 
Come well, on. yeah. You know, we branch on something like this in the morning about uh, all these awaiting trans yes. incidents, uh, non functioning, and all that. If, you see, other democratic systems have tried to find solutions to it. I know that the police, for instance, are trying to find solutions to some of these things. If you go to any police station now, you know they have a human rights office and all that. Yeah. Uh, but the question is, they have a human rights office to review some of these things and all that. And then you have our chief justices, and uh, justice of the uh, chief judges of states who go regularly to the prisons to see what is going on and release people occasionally and all that. I think we it's time to go beyond that. I take the example of the American system. What happened to them after this? Uh, they took to uh, appointing independent inspectors in some of these sectors. I would like to see an independent inspector in uh, in the police system, in every police station or so, who reduce what is going on there we, we, in, from a human rights perspective, who is independent, who is independent of the po police themselves, who reduce all these things and make sure that uh, people's human rights are not, not uh, uh, trampled upon in the process of the operation of the, the criminal uh, justice system. Um, who takes a stand outside the police and even outside the courts to some extent to compile reports about what is going on, who visits this prison regularly, who uh, stands aside and can go to a police station and request facts and writes reports regularly so so that we can keep track of it. And we are also independent to an extent of the IGP, the Inspector General of Police and State Police. So we can give independent reports and who cannot be removed except by uh, by maybe uh, out of the uh, state assembly or, or parliament or so. You have this innovation that was brought in in America after the same era. And I would want, wish that, that maybe that would be a more effective way. You, that independent inspector can be a lawyer, an independent lawyer who you pay some remuneration, whose job is independent, does it, it's not a policeman or all that, then he can do this job and all that and all that. Because we keep going around, the police, police have a human rights office, but you know, uh, when you, uh, when, who is committing uh, some of these atrocities? Some, some, some of these things, we the police are implicated in their heart. And then you're asking them to inspect themselves and all that. Yeah. You know, it doesn't work well. Maybe you need a lawyer, maybe a private person, or maybe working in the government, maybe from the Ministry of Justice or something, who is an independent inspector to review what the police are doing, who writes independent report regularly, maybe submits to the House of Assembly and send it. Hopefully, if uh, those legislators are able to read it and all that, they can apply remedial action to the police and our criminal justice system. That, that's all I see that can be done in that area. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. If, even that story I was trying to uh, t uh, t uh, say um, or give earlier on about the, the man who spent 10 months in prison just because of... Uh, is there under the picture of the president and others, the security uh, personnel there, uh, that on the same the Guardian, concerns as Abuja photographer spends 10 months in detention over what they call intentional insults. So let's hope that we get to that point where somebody will be auditing what they do in the police uh, and um, giving regular reports and hope that this person will so be somebody that cannot be compromised because uh, that's Thank another you. thing. Okay, so Afani Fere seeks regional NYSC Enforcement of Terrorism Prohibition Act. Uh, do you support that? Regional NYSC. The major reason for, for NYSC is national integration, where everybody can serve anywhere, get to know the, um, the lifestyle of other people, get to know their culture, get to to see ourselves as brothers anywhere we find ourselves. But if it becomes a regional thing, 
a southwest person remains in the southwest, a, a southeast person remains in the southeast, I, I think the NYSC uh, aim will be defeated. But what do you think? Well, let us now be honest with ourselves. You know, um, the country is facing several structural problems. Um, let me be honest. I know if your child was to be posted to uh, Maiduguri right now, or some states in the country, you don't want them to go. These are serious problems of how we live together right now. The situation that is on, on ground now, we shouldn't shy away from telling the truth. We should not be deceiving ourselves in the name of some sentiment about uh, uh, so national unity and all that. You see, we have reached a point in the country now where you cannot say that uh, agitation for regionalism is out of place. The honest truth is, if you go back in our history, how are we born? If you go back to the constitutional conferences that built this country, it was built largely on the unitary, on the regional system. If you go back to the constitution at that time, all these um, things like NYSA and all that, they are an outgrowth of military. They came about during the military government, which was trying in a way to using military means bring us uh, closer together. But you wonder if during the constitutional conferences, which were detailed, um, detailed deliberations and all that, if even during those long constitutional conferences, what we came up with was regional governments and a lot of regionalism and all that. And the, the British and the, some of our leaders who, are, who devised all this, they were not stupid people. They, they, they looked back at our and our, our structure and decided that this was what was best for us. Uh, the military did not do such a detailed analysis of who we are, how we came to be and all that. They cannot claim to have had higher intelligence, but here we are. We have the, um, uh, inherited what the military put in place, and we are running with it and implementing it. And so people are saying, let's go back to how we started in the first place and all that. In this um, talk about whether NYC should be regional or, or that, this is where you situate it. I situate it in this context of the larger agitation for more uh, regional governments in Nigeria. And you can't say that it's an agitation that is uh, that is out of place. Even the major political parties, at one time or the other, even the current uh, uh, actors in the in this regime, at one time or the other, about you advocated some kind of regionalism, as a, a return to true federalism. So you cannot say this. Uh, 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 this uh, agitation about uh, zonal uh, NYC is coming out of the blues. It's not really strange, you know. So these are movements that we will come to in, in, in the future if we are to get balanced as a nation. You cannot say that uh, it's out of place. It's, it's a, a movement, and this, it's part of a movement and a discussion which the nation should have, and which I believe the nation will have in due course in order to progress. That, that's my view of this. <laughs> Chicken and the egg, which one came first? But is we, should we talk about regional government first before we talk about this, or we should talk about this before regional government? Because if we're still priding ourselves as a nation and we're not looking at regional government yet, the aim of NYSC is to, to make everybody feel at home anywhere they find themselves. So if we're talking about regional government, it's understandable. Every region does what they feel that they can do. But now, we don't have that. And we're not even discussing that. Even though the present administration was big on, on um, restructuring, which we have not heard anything about, even from the previous administration. The, the, so which one should we take first? The 
going back to regional government or having regional NYSC, because this was supposed to cultivate people who think of Nigeria as one, not as regions that have come together. You see, you cannot uh, put it regiment how people feel and what they do and what they talk about in a democracy. So whether one should come before the other is really a good question. But they are raising it. People are raising it now. So it's a movement. You know, sometimes these things don't happen in certain in a particular order. This discussion is being raised so that you can go to the discussion of regional government. You know, so it's not, uh, it's like water. Water goes this way and goes that way, it mixes together and all that. You can't regulate this discussion. So maybe it's a part of it. Maybe we will then from here get to regional government, or maybe we we'll get to regional government before we get to this. But it's in all part of democratic discussions, and I don't think we should suppress it. We should let it flow and all that. If you look at history, that is how it goes. It goes in strange directions or up, down, left, right. So. It's unfortunate that we don't think about history anymore. It's even removed from our schools. So I don't know how we're going to be learning from the mistakes of the past and making a better future that's for us. Yeah, I think that should do more reading of history and all that. Uh, the problem we have with our leaders are not us. They are not people, thinking people. They no longer read. Really. You could see when Arulo was there, Arulo was not a lot. For instance, the issue we discussed about, Arulo is one of the clearest exponents of the issue of the legacy. Now, when you struggle to see any major leader who, who agitates something, some idea, some, uh, and this is other than right. money. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Mr. Aguilde. Thank you so much for being a part of our program this morning. It's always a pleasure having you join us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. We've been talking this morning with a solicitor in the person of uh, Mr. Stephen Agio. They were looking at the headlines that made it to the front pages of our national dailies. We'll take a break now. And when we return, uh, Tinubu is to hold talks with Xi Jinping in China. That will be our next topic. Stay with us.